What's up, peers, and welcome to Bitcoin to the Max here on the World Crypto Network. And today we answer a question that came up by Steve here on Twitter. And he asks, apologies if I've missed one of the shows, but could you please do a YouTube video about how fractional reserve paper Bitcoin trading as it is currently being talked about at MasterCard, might affect the future and, well, the price of Bitcoin. Thanks. Well, uh, Steve, thank you for proposing this question. And I do not think that I've talked about it, so uh, don't say sorry for uh, not missing one of these shows. Um, and it is really a compelling question. Well, first of all, what exactly is fractional reserve banking? And specifically, let's stick with the example of gold initially. So with gold, you either have a gold coin, right? And when you hold it, then it's yours. And you only have one gold coin and one gold coin represents one gold coin, right? There's nothing to that. But then when you put this gold coin into a money warehouse, right? Then, for example, you just do this for security reasons because this security provider can specialize in the division of labor or of being just more effective of storing and securing your gold coin. And if you in turn return, get a paper certificate that tells you that you exactly own this specific piece of gold laying in this specific location in this specific vault, and this is specifically yours and no one else, then we have exactly one paper receipt representing one gold coin. And that is your gold coin represented by your paper receipt. In that case, we do not have any fractional reserve. We have full reserve. That means that every paper note is backed by one specific gold coin in the money warehouse. And in that sense, there is not an increase in the money supply, right? There is still a one gold coin goes into the, the warehouse and one paper receipt comes back, right? So there's no creation of money. And as soon as you give this paper receipt back to the money warehouse, you prove that you are the rightful owner of this specific piece of gold. And thus, you destroy the paper certificate, but you take out the gold coin and have that back in circulation. So no increase of the money supply, which is good. Now, there is, of course, a fractional reserve system that, to be honest, has happened not just under government edict, but even in the free market regularly of free individuals choosing to do this. So fractional reserve inherently is not evil in a sense, as long as it is voluntary. And how this basic system works is that you have a, your gold coin and you put this in the money warehouse and then you agree to the condition that you get a paper receipt and at any time you can go back to the bank or money warehouse and exchange this specific paper receipt for any of the gold coins. So it is no longer a specific assumption of which gold coin is yours. And further, you can also agree with the bank or money warehouse that they can issue more paper receipts as they actually have gold coins in their safe. So this means that they issue additional paper certificates, which all say that anyone can redeem them at any time for the real gold in the safe. But if you have 10 gold coins in the safe, but 100 uh, paper receipts out there, then of course there are more paper receipts than you have gold coins in the money warehouse. And this means that if all these 100 individuals go to the bank and, or money warehouse and demand their property on the real gold coin at all at the same time, well, this would mean that the fractional reserve warehouse is illiquid. And therefore, they can no longer pay back all the claims on this paper receipt. And now the question is, is this inherently immoral? Is this inherently wrong? And that has been a big debate uh, with several really great uh, economists over the last year. So I'm not going to answer this question definitively here. But I would say that when the individuals know that the money warehouse is working with a fractional reserve system, then they are aware of the potential illiquidity risk. And this is a risk that will be priced in the market. And this also though means that the paper certificates or the storage service is going to be cheaper. 
right? Because this means that the bank can, or money warehouse, can earn more money with the same amount of gold coin in their bank safe, and thus it might be cheaper. You might get more interest on storing your gold there, for example. Uh, so as long as these conditions are chosen voluntarily and everything is transparent, then I personally do not think that there's an inherent issue with fractional reserve. However, does it increase the money supply? Yeah, it does. Because let's assume we have 10 gold coins in existence and these are circulating uh, in real gold coins in the economy. And then you put them into their money warehouse, all 10 of them, and you issue not 10 paper receipts or paper certificates, which would mean no increase of the money supply, but rather you give out 100 of these paper receipts and every single one of them represents one gold coin, well, then we have 100 paper receipts, 100 gold coins represented in them, and thus we have increased the money supply from 10 to 100. So because we have done that, this means we the Cantillon effect kings, kicks in, right? The purchasing power is shifted from those that produce this money uh, or to those that produce that money and from those that hold the money. And we have a realignment of prices and the, the price mechanism is misaligned and this might lead to overconsumption and malinvestment. So there are economic reasons, in my opinion, why fractional reserve banking is not optimal. Okay, how does this apply to Bitcoin? Well, if you have your hardware wallet, right? If you hodl your private keys yourself, if you control this non-scarce piece of information and occult it, if you keep it hidden, then this means that you are the only individual who has access to these coins, right? And one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. There is no paper receipt, just as there is no paper receipt initially in the gold economy, right? There are only 21 million Bitcoin, and if you own one of them, then you own a small, small fraction of the entire Bitcoin supply and no fractional reserve inherently. However, when you, for example, put your Bitcoin in a custodial wallet, so you give up your private keys and you give up the financial sovereignty in that sense, then to, for example, Mt. Gox, then there is the possibility that Mt. Gox would store exactly this one Bitcoin in this one address and links to some other identifier to you. You don't have the private key to this Bitcoin for the on-chain transaction, but you can identify exactly what your Bitcoin is. That is, for example, what Voltoro is doing, right? Every customer who stores his Bitcoin with Voltoro knows exactly which on-chain address is his. He just doesn't have the private key for it. So then we have a full full reserve system for custodial wallets. And Voltoro is a beautiful example for that and it works quite well, I might add. But then you could have something like what happened with Mt. Gox, right? That some Bitcoin were stolen from the cold storage of Mt. Gox and they just did not redeem the certificates, right? So they still had claims on Bitcoin uh, by their true holders of the currency, right? By by those that get the receipt of the Mt. Gox tokens or uh, well, claims on the Bitcoin in Mt. Gox cold storage. And however, there were not enough Bitcoin in reserve for Mt. Gox to at any time liquidate all of them, right? So if all the people would come to Mt. Gox and claim true control of their Bitcoin, well, then that just would not be possible for Mt. Gox to fulfill all these claims. Thus, Mt. Gox would be illiquid and would completely break away and be bankrupt. Did that happen? Yeah, it did quite often, actually. And fractional reserve has happened in Bitcoin and probably is still occurring in Bitcoin. This is why it is so damn important that you huddle your own private keys. Because when you are the only one who has access to these private keys, then you know that there is no illiquid token or illiquid paper receipt that where you can claim your Bitcoin, but you actually present the Bitcoin yourself, right? There is no representative token for these Bitcoin. So do we have fractional reserve in Bitcoin? Yep. Is it good? Uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I personally do see some issues, but as long as it's chosen voluntarily, it's not for me to decide. And individuals will use Bitcoin 
in a fractional reserve model if this increases their value, if this increases their use case for Bitcoin, their individual preference case. So we can't really say if it's good or bad, but it definitely is happening in Bitcoin. But not if you own your own keys or if you control your own keys, you can't own information, but you can own the Bitcoin behind that. So Piers, as usual, thank you very much for joining me here at Bitcoin to the Max. Now, after we finished the reading of Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money, we will continue with these short um, and precise videos of one specific topic. And if you have a question, please feel free to go to tallycall.in slash hellobrandmax. And in the early access tab, there's also a way for you to ask a tally chat question, which is a question where you can uh, throw me a couple of satoshis and then I will go in depth and answer the question that you have there or just reach out for me on, uh, to me on Twitter and we can do that as well. Uh, it's not about the money, it's about the learning experience. So Piers, thank you very much and see you on the next show. Bye-bye. <laughs>